We are at the Zululand Yacht Club in Richards Bay, South Africa, and we've been waiting here for three weeks to try and find a weather window to allow us to sail on down this wild coast towards Cape Town. Now the weather of this coast has a notorious reputation with big waves, rogue waves, that are capable of breaking up ships. So we're being very careful with our weather planning. It looks like there is an opportunity coming up, but before that we've got time for one little more exploration inland. Yeah, being stuck here is no real problem though because it gives us the opportunity to see more of the stunning natural landscape in South Africa. So we're going to pack our bags and head inland to the Drakensberg Ridge where we're hopefully going to be able to hike one of the tallest waterfalls in the world. There is something about mountains that draws us from the sea. Perhaps it is because we spend our lives at sea level that these magnificent heights have such an effect on us. Perhaps the mountains and oceans have more in common than first seems. They are both places to get away from it all, to find peace. They hold beauty in their vastness, and yet at the same time, they can both be incredibly challenging. This is our base for the hike to the waterfall, an amazing perch on a mountain ridge where we can gaze out across this breathtaking scenery. We booked the smallest, cheapest backpacker room that they had available and we arrived and they just gave us an upgrade as, as soon as we arrived so we get this lovely room with a view. Bit of a treat. <laughs> Oops. Tomorrow morning we hike to the waterfall. It's been months since we walked any distance and three years since we hiked in the mountains. Yet we have chosen one of the toughest hikes with no warm up. We may soon be regretting our choice. We are Matt and Amy. We left England in 2016 on a mission to sail around the world. Just the two of us on our 37 foot sailboat Florence. Five years on we have sailed over 35,000 miles across three oceans, exploring new countries and cultures along the way. Well, that's a pretty amazing view to wake up to this morning. And we're going hiking somewhere up there today to the second tallest waterfall in the world. And it is a stunning day. It's so different to life at sea level. I think we're 3,000 meters up now. Part of the reason for staying here is that it's the closest accommodation to the hike and they also run a shuttle service to the start of the hike but the road up there is seven kilometers and it's totally impassable by anything but four by four. This looks amazing. The air is so clear, it's so fresh. I'm so looking forward to this, although I don't think my legs are looking forward to this. Unfortunately, we're a bit pressed for time today. It's a six hour hike and we've got a one and a half hour drive. 
that we need to get done to our next accommodation uh, before it gets dark tonight. So we're on a bit of a mission, but it's such a shame because I could easily stop every, every couple of minutes and take some more photos and some more film. A lot of the hikes that we go on, you just get one big view, but this is just absolutely incredible. Every little switchback has a new view and they're all just equally stunning. This is spectacular. I think we've got a big gully to go down and up and then you can see the path just runs along below those impressive rock faces over there to a waterfall and then I think we go up and onto the plateau itself. A lot of the blogs I read about this hike compared it to the Tongarero Alpine Crossing in New Zealand, which we did. But I can't really compare it because the day we did that it was pretty much covered in fog so we couldn't really see anything. So this is much better. When we set out to do this hike, we believed that this was the second tallest waterfall in the world, after Angel Falls in Venezuela. But apparently, Dugela Falls here in South Africa has recently been re-measured and is actually the tallest waterfall in the world. So we've reached the chain ladder section of the route and we've got this sheer vertical cliff to get up to get onto the plateau and the top of the waterfall. And so these chain ladders should take us all the way up there. I think we've got like two sections uh, to get past, but it's really exposed and absolutely vertical. So it's a good job that we both don't mind heights. At least I think we don't mind heights. Even if it didn't hold a chance to see the tallest waterfall in the world, the Sentinel Peak hike would be worth it for the views alone. So that's not the waterfall, but it's pretty impressive anyway. The wind just blows it away as it gets halfway down. Once we had climbed the chain ladders, we very quickly reached the flat plateau. Here we found the Tugela River, which leads to the waterfall and all we had to do was follow it all the way to the edge of the precipice for a view of the tallest waterfall in the world. No barriers. No railings and no tourist house pushing souvenirs. Just the sheer force of nature as the icy water plunges 983 metres through a series of five cascades to the valley floor below. The Dugela River begins its journey as a stream on the 3,050 metre high plateau near the border of Lesotho before plunging down the Drakensberg Ridge and cutting a deep gorge on its way to South Africa's east coast, where it flows into the Indian Ocean. Just like sailing on the ocean, hiking in the mountains is also heavily weather dependent, and we were keeping one eye on the sky. Just as we started to feel brave enough to fly the drone in the strong gusty winds, one of the few other hikers at the top 
lost control of his in a big gust and had to pick it up out of the water. As the thunderclouds rolled in and the rain started, we decided to pack our drone away and get ourselves off the mountaintop as soon as possible. We would have to work hard to get that full waterfall view another way. There was definitely no upgrade offered at the next accommodation, but it was worth the stop for the close proximity it gave us to the lower section of the Vorontau National Park home to lots of smaller waterfalls and a gorge hike that we hoped would give us a better view of the tallest waterfall in the world. Yesterday it was really hard to see the entire waterfall, even when you went as close to the edge as you dared and peered down it. And we got chased off by that massive thunderstorm in the afternoon. So today we walked up the gorge, which is the base of the waterfall. It's a similar length hike, uh, but now we've got an absolutely stunning view of the entire falls. Although we were a six hour drive from Florence, we were still checking the weather forecast every day and the appearance of a possible weather window to sail on down the wild coast towards Cape Town had us packing our bags and heading home. Talk to any round the world cruising sailor about the most challenging part of the voyage and the coast of South Africa is sure to be near the top of the list. We have been concerned about this section since the planning stage before we left England in 2016. This is a place where it's critical to get the weather planning right. The penalties for getting it wrong can be severe. It's a beautifully calm morning, but we're about to start sailing down what's known as the wild coast this morning. We've been waiting over a month here in Richards Bay for a suitable weather window to sail down this bit of coast. It doesn't look perfect, but hopefully we'll be able to get as far as East London at least. The weather here changes quickly and there are very few safe havens to stop if you do find yourself in difficulty. However, as with anywhere in the world, as long as you get the weather right, it can be a fantastic sail. Friends who'd left just a few days before us were chronically seasick on this passage. Despite the calm start, we'd both taken our seasick tablets in preparation as we expected to face a rough sea state. <laughs> so we're finally motoring out here. We're motoring out into no wind because the weather windows down this bit of coast are really difficult. It's a notorious piece of coast for being difficult and stormy to get past. One of the most challenging parts of any circumnavigation. And that's because the weather windows are few and far between and they're so short. So we're trying, we've got to hop down the coast because we won't get a weather window that's good enough for us to get all the way down to Cape Town in one go. So we're leaving this morning, we're having to motor in light winds or no wind to start with because if we don't, if we're waiting for the wind to actually fill in, 
then we wouldn't have enough time to get to our destination at the other end. Now, we're trying to go to East London, which is about 350 miles. And we've got the Agulhas current with us. So for some of that, I expect to be seeing boat speeds uh, higher than we've ever seen before on Florence without surfing. So we should be seeing boat speeds like eight, nine, 10. Eight, nine, 10 knots. I'm just looking around because we're motoring through this massive fleet of cargo ships that's anchored outside Rich's Bay port. I think they're all, most of them coal carriers because it's a coal port. Richards Bay is not only one of South Africa's largest harbours, but also one of the largest coal export facilities in the world, hence all the ships. As you'll know if you've followed us over the last five years of this voyage, we try to avoid motoring as much as possible. And thankfully it was not long before a light breeze appeared and allowed us to start sailing. Well, the breeze has filled in and now we are absolutely flying along. We're doing 10 knots. We're actually averaging 10 or 11 knots over the ground. That's the Agulhas current. Got at least four or five knots of Agulhas current helping us. There's still a bit of a lumpy sea state because the wind was still coming from the south when we first came out. But it is so much nicer out here than we expected it to be. It's gorgeous sailing. Due to the fearsome reputation of this section of the coast, we had mentally prepared ourselves for an awful rough passage, something that we would just have to endure. And we were tense as we left port. So once we realised that in fact we had almost perfect sailing conditions, the release of that mental tension left us feeling euphoric and we could not stop smiling. Probably the fastest ever day that we've had sailing Florence but it's strange it really doesn't feel like that we're just like on a conveyor belt and it feels like we're just doing regular speeds when at times we're averaging about 10 knots so twice our regular speed especially now the swells dropped off it's just really gentle smooth sailing not what we expected on this passage at all wait till the next bit to Cape Town yeah it's definitely, it's not over yet, but I expected it all to be rough and all to be a bit on the edge. So um, any, any little bit that we've had of smooth sailing is a bonus. So we built up sailing down this coast in our minds. The Agulhas current is known to be uh, very dangerous if you get a southerly wind, but actually we've had a really, really nice sail. And at the moment, I think the worst thing that's gonna happen to us, touch wood, is that we're gonna run out of wind about five or six hours before we get there and have to motor. We've been making nine or 10 knots average down with the help of the current. And we've just got these nice calm conditions, which is not what a lot of other people have had sailing down this coast. But I guess it really shows that when you're cruising, you've got to wait for the right weather window. Sometimes it's not clear what is the right and best weather window. And if you wait, you often can get it so you can have a nice sail, even in some kind of dangerous areas of the world. Although it's not over yet, because we still got to get all the way around to Cape Town, which is another, I think, another 500 miles or so, so. We've also got to get into East London in the dark. Oh, we've got to get, yeah. <laughs> we've also got to get into the next port in the dark, because that's just the way the timing's worked out. But it's a commercial port, it's not like going in through a reef, unmarked reef entrance into an atoll somewhere, so hopefully it should be okay. And hopefully that thunderstorm that's over there doesn't come any closer.
wind's just done a complete 180. It's now coming from the south or the south southwest, which is not good news if you're in the current because it can create some big waves. But thankfully, we were just on the edge of the current and we tacked over to head inshore to get into the shallows and out the current so we don't get those big waves. And it wasn't long before we went through almost a line in the water and suddenly the current kind of almost switched off. We still got a little with us. So we've got 21 miles to go, which is now we're going to have to zigzag tacking up wind to get there. Not ideal, but uh, if it stays like this, it'll be fine. It's noticeably colder now the wind's coming from the south. I've got my jumper on and my woolly hat on. It was warm when it was coming from the north, but I guess this one's blowing off of Antarctica or something. The light wind blowing directly against us. We had to zigzag our way up the coast in the dark. Yes, we could have turned on the engine and got there faster, but it's not what we're about. So after two long days and one full night at sea, we pulled into East London at 11 p.m., having made it safely past South Africa's notorious wild coast. That gave us some of the fastest, but ironically also some of the easiest and most uneventful sailing that we've had on Florence. Next time, we tackle the second half of this coast, past Cape Agulhas and into the Atlantic Ocean. But the Cape of Storms doesn't let us off so lightly. Don't forget to subscribe to catch the next episode. We release a video every two weeks. If you'd like to find out more about behind the scenes on Florence, track our progress across the oceans in real time, find out where we are right now, or ask us pretty much anything, then please head over to our Patreon site and join the crew. We'd like to thank everyone who supports us to make these videos possible. And a special thank you to our staff patrons.